with the energies and the bid uh, in the WTI, the Brent I saw overnight to $85. Yep, <clears throat> 85 bucks is, is really a target that uh, we've been putting out there uh, discussing with WTI in, in Brent, really ninety dollars for Brent would be the, the move, and, and eighty five for for WTI. Um, we we put out last week when when crude fell back uh, below eighty bucks, and and I I put out our notes that we we believe it's entirely possible to see WTI go to eighty five uh, into the uh, the expiration of the November contract. I, I had multiple clients, not just one, but multiple clients call in and say, are you serious? $85? Mm. I mean, you're talking about a, a week, week and a half. Crude just fell buck, three bucks from the high. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're serious. And um, and that's what we're seeing right now. I mean, the, you look at look at the data yesterday in, in the EIA numbers. Um, it, it wasn't really a it wasn't a bullish report. You had this big build uh, and crude. It was actually, um, you know, the, the API data the night before had reason to be bullish. If you saw these massive draws in the products. But uh, you, although despite the headline build in, in crude now in EIA yesterday, you had the big, big build in crude. And you didn't have as large as draws in the products. And um, but but still, you're seeing these markets battle higher, and that's that's the you know the energy crunch that's going on you know through Europe through with, with involving Russia. I mean, but that's this is just this is a commodity. It's a secular commodity bull market, and really what what I'm also looking at too is is the changeover that's taking place from from the refineries, and you're looking at heating oil below five year averages. Um, even even the five year range, it's like sitting in the bottom end. The stockpiles and heating oil sitting in the bottom end of the of that range. Um, so I, I just think there's there's so many so many just undertones of bullishness that are taking place within the energy space right now that th these pullbacks are just getting gobbled up and, and buyers are stepping in and taking the new highs. Yeah, you know, one of the uh, well, a couple of the products that we've been watching, you mentioned heating oil. Give me a second. I'll pull that chart here because I, I think they are equally impressive as you kind of work your way through the energy quadrant and. Uh, here we can see, again, the move up, as Bill mentioned, heating oil uh, also enjoying gains here up to $2.59, almost two sixty dollars here right now. And it uh, looks like if higher today, three days in a row to the upside. And I'm looking at this down. month. Bill, up 10% this month. I was just going to say down only three days since the end of September on the 21st and uh, quite the move up through this 220 level. Now, I do want to point out here, we've got crude on the left, Arbom on the right. Both of these have been accelerated to the upside. Bill, you briefly mentioned some of the energy crunch that's been creating this environment here. I've been hearing about uh, ultimately how some of the UK energy providers have been going under. This is limiting some of the options that are available for consumers. And I mean, uh, there's really no and in sight in terms of this demand for the crude products coming as, uh, again, natural gas, coal for many areas uh, in Asia, for example, at record levels. I mean, we're talking about uh, it's had to shift sort of the demand narrative and, and beneficiary being crude, it seems like. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you what, traders have crushed it. We, we deal with a lot of prop traders, too, around the world. Speculative. And a number of prop traders, they shut down for the, for the, for the year already, trading things like the Dutch natural, Dutch natural gas. They made their money already. Mm -hmm. in, I mean, they, these traders have crushed it on these moves. But um, it, it's not just energy. I mean, we're focused on energy. But co like, you, like you said, the start of copper is up 10% this week. Heating oil is up 10% this month. Crude oil is up 10% this month. Gasoline is 11% this month. Cotton's lock limit higher right now. It's 20% over the last two months. Coffee's up 8% this week. Lumber's up 23, 23% this month. I'm just rattling these off. These, this is this is a massive move across the commodity space. But what's also stoking it is, is the PPI and CPI data this week. These numbers were not hot. These numbers were right in line with expectations. And, and ultimately, that that stokes this inflation. Because if these numbers came in hot, then you would see the US dollar rally pretty sharply. It would mean the Fed has to tighten sooner. But really, this, you know, you, you also pointed to Powell really disconnecting the taper from, from the rate hike. This is a Goldilocks scenario for a secular bull market right here, right now. This is the new wave of the secular bull market in, in commodities. I think it's going to last for quite a bit. But this is that wave, the wave that we saw through through May and June now and then the Fed kind of put a kibosh on it at their meeting in June this is this is it reinvigorated now and and there's there's some legs to this thing you know, many were talking about a commodity super cycle back last summer, the run up into July that we saw. And as we pulled back, some of those uh, conversations sort of uh, cooled, some are eased. But it does seem like we're starting to see that again. Copper, as you mentioned, a very strong run up up and through the 50 day moving average of higher today. It looks like six of the last seven 
to the upside and not far from that 488 high that they saw uh, earlier this spring back in May. Bill, let's talk about how you mentioned some of the other products. The one you didn't really bring to the uh, discussion here yet was grains. We had the Wazi report this week. They sold off viciously. Beans have been on a bit of a slide coming off, but I guess this is one sort of area in terms of the commodities discussion where we have seen some weakness. Yeah, you're right. We, we have seen some weakness, and, and that the market is is really digesting the move that that happened earlier this year. And, and the move that happened earlier this year was, was really on, on a positioning standpoint. And, and if you look back, and our, our my partner Oliver Slope, who handles all of our agriculture business, he was on top of this with with the corn early on. You look back at, at March and, and April, they were there was uh, net long record net long positions from the funds. You're, you're talking about speculative hedge funds getting record net long, and as as corn was getting going higher and going higher, you wouldn't you were not seeing that record net long position decrease one bit. And that's rare. It's extremely rare to mm -hmm. see that because these people are in business to make money. Mm -hmm. So usually when they're making money, they're going to take some profit off the table and they were not doing that. And, the, and what you were seeing is is basically extremely large positions from the short from uh, from the producers who were who were short selling off their crop. Now they were getting squeezed as this market was going higher. They ultimately had had to rebuy positions because there was a there was a a uh, limit expansion that was going to be taking place uh, through I think it was in June or July it actually took place and and they were looking the funds were looking for that limit expansion to 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 actually pick up new contracts so they were at record net longs and they added to those contracts and squeezed this thing higher so I I, I think the market uh, listen I'm I'm not extremely into the fundamentals on on agriculture's that's that's my partner's job and he's he's terrific with it but what I will say is he was on it in, in the fact that this market had that big move through the early part of the summer and that's also a seasonal move it it, it really corn does top out seasonally uh, almost every year through through uh, the middle end of end of june but that move really was was a huge huge move and the market is now digesting that i wouldn't be surprised to see you know another wave but mm -hmm. uh, higher through the early part of next year when that thing gets started again in, in march and, and may but right now we're really digesting these prices yeah, and in, from what I'm seeing here, uh, as we hold near the lower extreme of that digestive uh, uh, you know, consolidation area, it seems like we could even open up a door for a lower extreme test here again, a retest and potentially some more downside momentum prior to regaining composure and starting to work our way higher. Grains oftentimes very cyclical. If we could talk about, uh, or just look at, I should say, how it's not just corn, which has come off. We just showed it below the 50-day moving average as you were talking about corn. But here we can see we've got uh, beans below the 50-day moving average as well. And I also, well, here's corn again, but take a look. Beans below the 50-day moving average, as mentioned, and they've been on a slide. And then, well, wheat's been kind of hovering right around it for the most part. Um, Bill, real quick, I wanted to get your thoughts on this retail sales number headed our way. Maybe not as uh, big of a focal point as some of the inflation data due out earlier in the week, but with it coming in somewhat muted, I guess a lot of traders and investors are going to want to get some insight in terms of some of the consumer trends and what we've been seeing. This number uh, certainly should not be discounted. Would you agree? Yeah, you got to pay attention to it. I was just looking at what, what the expectations were. You're looking at, I mean, no, nothing crazy. It's mm -hmm. just, just po um, you know, a positive uh Actually, the, actually, you're looking at the headline number to to contract a little bit, and and um, in the in the the core number to pick up just a little bit. I, it's, so it's so it's nothing nothing not a big number. If if we see decent growth, I think that's positive. My my narrative, and I come on talk talk with you about equities quite a bit too in, the, in your later show, and and my narrative has been we're going to see earnings beat. We're going to see we're going to see earnings really surprise the upside. And, and we saw these growth expectations get, get decreased, trim, 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 all through the, the end of the summer through August, and then the market sold off really sharply. There's a lot of pessimism out there. You're starting to see that optimism turn. And the market, look at the, you were highlighting the, the run here in the equities and the Russell and the S&P. I, I, I am very, you know, have leaned in, on overweight energy, overweight financials. I've been trimming that a little bit into that, the energy strength. I mean, things like you know, Pioneer uh, and and Oxy, all those all those stocks have had their move, um, and then I think we're starting to see a, a bit of a rotation back into tech. But if we see a strong retail sales number, that's that's what the the consumer discretionary sector really needs right here. Targets had a good week. You saw Walmart beat earnings earlier this week. Um, so. Uh, uh, sorry, Walgreens uh, beat. But what you want, if you see this, if you see this retail sales number come in strong, I, I think that's going to be a real tailwind to the consumer sector that really needs it, and, and it's starting to show some good signs uh, with some of the stocks moving really well this week.